I love Traverse City, and what a wonderful amount of speeches I've already heard this morning. It's been absolutely tremendous. Um, I've been watching all of these TEDx events, and the first thing I was worrying about was that 18-minute clock. And I noticed you guys have started the clock for me already. Where for the first couple of guys, the clock didn't run for the first five minutes. So <laughs> I'm not going to worry about the clock. I was driving here from Chicago last night, and I had my iPad on my dashboard going through my presentation. And I had my, I used to not supposed to do that, but it was midnight. No one was around. <laughs> and the crazy thing was, I put my phone with that timer. I don't, I don't use it to work out. I just use it to time my speeches. And every moment that those seconds ticked, I got more nervous about speaking. So I'm not going to worry about the clock right now. So the topic of my speech is uh, repositioning Islam in America. Um, I specialize in brand marketing and advertising. And I help large companies position their brands by leveraging sports, entertainment, or cause-related properties or by assigning themselves with celebrities. And as a Muslim, I happen to be a Muslim American whose parents are from India, one thing that I've noticed um, is that the position of Islam, when you look at it from a product perspective, so how is Islam perceived in the marketplace in the United States of America really, really sucks. It's absolutely horrendous. And if you look at most brands, what most brands want to do is they'll spend hundreds of millions of dollars aligning themselves up with people like Michael Jordan, with Nike. Maybe an Olympic skier like Lindsey Vonn, who endorses Red Bull and Under Armour. Or maybe, maybe a beautiful entertainer like Beyonce, who endorses L'Oreal and has done work with Pepsi. Those are the people who speak on some of the biggest brands in the world. For Muslims, if you look at Islam as a brand, who are the people who speak on our behalf? Are they myself? No. Are they people who are absolutely normal? No. The people who speak upon our brand are guys like Saddam Hussein, guys like Mohammed Gaddafi, and guys like Osama bin Laden. Now, thank God they're all dead, so they can no longer speak in our behalf, but if you look at our life over the past 20 years, ever since the Iranian hostage situation, these are the kinds of guys who've represented the religion. And normally, that wouldn't be a problem if most Americans knew who Muslims were. But according to Time Magazine, 62% of Americans don't personally know a Muslim. That, my friends, is a problem. And it's a problem from a brand marketing perspective. If I made myself the manager or the marketing manager of Islam worldwide, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem for our religion because if you do not know a Muslim and you live in America, you're going to only know a Muslim through what you see in the media. Therefore, the Muslims you know are Saddam and Osama and Muammar Gaddafi. And therefore, that's the association you're going to have with Muslims and Islam. It becomes a further issue because I've personally felt, and I've lived here. 44 of the 46 years of my life, or no wait, 43 of the 45, I'm not 46, I'm only 45, um, <laughs> as my wife wants to tell me. Because after September 11th, I felt that we've gone from a country of inclusiveness of religion and color and race and ethnicity to one that's been a little bit exclusive. And it's been exclusive in terms of not really accepting American Muslims as being American. We've kind of gone back to our traditional image of what an American is by this historical picture of the cowboy on a horse or on a Harley Davidson wearing the American flag. And for me, that's really been a tough thing to handle. Because as I grew up, I was always the American kid. With my dad, all before high school at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, I went to Libya, I went to Saudi Arabia, I spent time in Pakistan, I spent time in India and in Europe. And I wasn't the Muslim kid, I wasn't the Indian kid, I was always the American kid. I was the guy who'd tell the Britishers how the dollar's better than the pound. I was the kid when I was in Pakistan who would tell my cousins that your game of football sucks, our American football is much better. <laughs> you know, I was the guy who was cheering the American hockey squad on when Miracle of Ice happened. And so for me, after 9-11, to be questioned in my own country about whether I'm a patriot and whether I'm an American was really hard. Um, and it was also it was interesting because after September 11th, my dad, who gives a lot of uh, sermons in mosques around the country, he always talks about the land of opportunity and the American dream. He came to me and my wife with an American flag. And he goes, put American flag on your car so no one will look at you funny when you're driving around. I had an aunt call me and go, you know, your name is Rashid, maybe you should change it to Ricardo. And I go, well, I can, you know. <laughs> True story. My brother's name is Osama. He'd always get funny looks in the airport and then get the security officers on the plane sitting next to him. So, um, and I said, well, I can go for Hispanic, Indian, Hispanic, we kind of look similar. Um, I even had a friend say, you know, you travel a lot, wear the American flag underwear. You can get a pair. Because <laughs> if you get strip searched, they'll know where the flag sits. You're, you're right there, you stuck the flag. And, and for me, in all seriousness, you know, I didn't do any of that because 
I had never felt the need to wear the flag on my sleeve because I always wore the flag in my heart. I was the kid who, when I came back from Libya, if you can believe I was in Libya in 1979 with a group of American kids visiting their country, an exchange program, four days after we came back, our jets shot down their jets, so I was glad I, I got back home. But I was the kid in Skokie, Illinois, who when I got home, after three weeks in Libya, I crisped the ground in front of my parents' house because I was so happy to be home. So it's an issue not only for me, but I also felt what kind of a country are we creating for my wife and my daughter um, and my boys, who aren't pictured right there. Both my wife and my daughter are Americans. They're both born in this country, love this country. But as a Muslim, I wondered if other things happen and we don't change the shape of what we're doing, what's the future hold for them? So I thought back to two things that really impacted me as a kid. One was reading Roots and seeing the movie, the miniseries. I don't know how, you, how enough of you are old enough to remember when it aired on ABC. And also reading the diary of Anne Frank. And I thought the brilliance of Anne Frank and the brilliance of Alex Haley was they had the courage to tell a story of their own people. And as I looked to the question of how do you reposition your religion, what I thought that we as Muslims hadn't done, we had done a good job of blaming the media. We had done a good job of blaming the media. But what we had done a poor job of was telling our stories to our fellow Americans. And telling them in a contextual, impactful way, and telling them in an entertaining way. Not telling them a story that's boring and old, but bringing a story of Islam to them in a relevant, meaningful manner. So if you were posed with that question, how do you reposition your religion as a Muslim in this country, what would you do? Well, I did what any American would do. I made a movie. <laughs> and the movie is called Forged in Faith, Fasting, Football, and the American Dream. Back in 2004, a friend of mine from USA Today called me up, Chris Lawler, and said, hey, there's this high school football team in Dearborn, Michigan. And the amazing thing about this team is that the school in Dearborn is an American public school founded by Henry Ford the student body population is 98% Arab American Muslim. And I'm writing an article about them that's going to be in the paper tomorrow because it's November, it's the month of Ramadan, and the team has gotten to the Michigan State semifinals. So they're one of four teams left in the entire state in their division playing for a state championship. And oh, by the way, the kids all fast from sunrise to sunset, no food or drink through practices and through games. And as somebody who televises high school sports all across the country for ESPN, one of the things that I noticed is that there's nothing more American than high school football, right? It's bigger than college or bigger than the professionals because the parents played, the kids play, and it embodies your entire community. And as I went and visited Fordson and did research on the school, to me it was absolutely amazing that this group of Arab Americans had integrated football and the American way of life into their culture and into their ethnicity. And so I wanted to tell the story. And an interesting thing happened to me along the way. One of the boys that I interviewed back in 2004, his name was Osama. He was a linebacker. And he asked me what I was doing, and I told him my idea and what we would do. And he goes, you know, it's a great idea, but nobody cares. He goes, there's not one person that cares to hear our story. Nobody cares about Arab Americans in this country. And I was, I was taken aback by his comments. I was hurt by his comments. But I was also inspired by his comments. Because I'm like, you know what, nobody cares. I go, I bet people care and I give a shit. I actually care about you, and I care about your community. So over the next five years, I basically had to convince the Board of Education to give me the rights. When I first had the idea, I didn't have $5,000 in my pocket to make the movie. Over the next five years, my wife and I saved up enough money to build a house, and then miraculously in 2009, we got the rights to make the movie. We couldn't get funding because of timing, so my wife and I basically sold all of our stock and funded the entire film ourselves and, and, and um, put off building a house. One of the amazing things to me about Fordson was the blend of Islam with football. And when you go to Dearborn, if you have a chance, it's visually stunning because it's an American town with the flag everywhere, but yet Islam and Arabic language are completely integrated as one. And for the people in Fordson, it's no different for them to be an Arab American Muslim. It's, that's just as normal as it may be for somebody at Notre Dame to be Irish Catholic American. And so graphically, we blended Islam and American football together. And this is our poster, so we put the mosque. I told my graphic designer, I don't know anything about graphic design, put the mosque on the football field. And so he made that poster with our, with our kids. And so one of the things that we wanted to do within the film was answer a lot of questions that you people may have about the religion of Islam and do it in an entertaining way and leverage football as a conduit to talk about race and religion and September 11th and immigration and the American dream. And so some of the images we showed were quite compelling. 
One was, here's a picture of our forts and football players doing a very American thing. They're praying to God before a football game. But rather than doing the Lord's Prayer, they're reciting Surah Fatiha, which is the first verse in the Holy Quran. Here was an image of a minaret in the Dearborn Mosque with the American flag flying by. And again, it was this blending of the American dream in America with a mosque. Um, and these are all things that we found as we went along the way, nothing that we actually created. Um, when I said to you that 62% of Americans don't know a Muslim, this was the picture of the lady that I showed you. So let me tell you her story. She went to Fordson High School. She was born in this country. She married the star quarterback of the high school football team. They had four kids. Their eldest son in the movie is a quarterback for the Fordson High School football team. His senior year, he broke the passing record for most touchdowns thrown in a single season. He broke his dad's record, and he wears number 32 in honor of his father, who wore number 32. In their basement, this lady has got a printing press for t-shirts. Why? Because she works for the booster club, and she prints the shirts and sells them to raise money for the team. That's the Muslim lady that I know, and I know a lot of them like that, not the terrorist, not the woman in hijab that you, can't speak, you think can't speak English, not the Osama bin Laden, the Muhammad Qaddafis, or the Saddam Husseins, and that's the kind of woman that I wanted the rest of America to know, because that's really what an American Muslim woman is like. Here's another family. This couple had nine children in America. They immigrated here when they just got married from the Middle East. The man on the left has worked in the General Motors assembly line building American cars for 35 years. His son, Bucker, is an all-state football player who dreams of what? Going to the University of Michigan on a football scholarship, playing in the Big Ten, and then playing in the NFL. That sounds pretty American to me. So the next thing that we did in the movie is we wanted to address September 11th. And that's always a very touchy subject, obviously. And one of the criticisms that I always hear about Muslims in America and September 11th, or any terrorist act, is how come you don't protest? And the reality is, if you go and look at any Muslim organization, every time there's a terrorist attack, we send out emails and letters condemning the attack and saying, this is not what we believe in, for, believe in this is not what we stand for. We work with the FBI, we work with the CIA, we work with the local police departments, but the news media never reports that because that's a good story. And you know how the news media is, not just with Islam, with anything, if it bleeds, it leads. So we asked people, what do you think about Osama bin Laden? And here's the response we got from an old-time guy who lives in Dearborn named Yusuf Berry. You know, once you're tagged, you're tagged. It's going to go on for generations. You think they're going to forget about now what happened in 9-11, which had nothing to do with us? I mean, the guy's a maniac. What kind of maniac would want to kill over 2,000 people to set what? set an example, to send a message. And they can't find this guy. How do you like that? Don't put a guy in the moon, you can't find Osama bin Laden. I think that would ease the tension if they found him and they executed him. The man was sick. He deserves to be shot on national television. Um, we shot the film in 2009, so of course at the end of a movie we have a little graphic that says uh, Big Joe's still waiting for the video footage um, for President Obama. So we, we put all those things in, put a trailer up, got tremendous response. From our fellow Americans, we got the message of we didn't know. From Muslim Americans off our five-minute trailer, we had people saying I'm crying because for the first time somebody's actually told the story of who we are, that we're patriotic, that we love the country, that we stand against terrorism, we believe in the American dream. So all those logos up there, I thought every one of those logos would want to see the film, take the film in their festivals, put the film on the television networks. Every one of those logos rejected our film. The craziest was the one on the left, the Al Jazeera Documentary Film Festival in the Middle East. I'm like, how in the hell does the Al Jazeera Documentary Film Festival not take our movie? I mean, it was like, and someone's like, oh, they're self-hating Arabs, who knows? So, what I learned from this was, was this. I thought I'd change the world with the film and everyone would want the film, but I, I learned this. In life, it's not about who rejects you, it's about who accepts you, right? If you ask Miss USA out on a date to prom, not that I would, I'm married, but if you ask her out and she says no, there are like 147 missed somethings to ask. There are a lot of people out there. So what happened to us? We got a call from the US government, the Operation of Special Commands, that's Admiral Olson right there. He's in charge of the SEALs and the Rangers highest ranking Navy SEAL in US history. He goes, will you come to a conference with 150 defense officials and talk about your film? I was scared out of my mind, but we went. We showed the film, 
And he walked up to me and goes, I want to thank you for making this movie on behalf of our country. I had another lady come up to me and said, I've got four sons, and my, my husband's a major general. He's done three tour of duties in Iraq. And she goes, I've got to tell you, your movie was cathartic to me. And she was shaking, and she said, I hated Muslims and Arabs because I didn't know, and I've watched your film and realized I was wrong. Really, really powerful. We then came to a little city called Traverse City. And I wanted Michael Moore to see the film. I was the kind of guy who was first in line to see his movies in the theater. I shook when I saw him. I was blown away. And I'm like, how do I get Michael Moore to see my film? Sent the DVD. There's no application process. You just send the DVD with thousands of other people. At 2.30 in the morning, I'd given up hope. I got an email while editing the film with my editor. And it was from Deb Lake, his assistant. She goes, Michael loves your film. I just about did you know what in my pants. <laughs> And I sent the DVD back, and I was shaking the next day because Michael was sitting in this town watching my film. He not only took our film in, he put us on Friday night on Main Street. We sold out the State Theater, got a standing ovation, and we won Best U.S. Doc. And I want to thank Traverse City for the hospitality they had. <laughs> By far the best experience that we had in making this film was being here. And here's Michael, who was gracious enough to give us a quote with our producers and our cameramen and our editor and coach Saban. We then got a call from the State Department. And the guy who heads up Muslim relations for President Obama goes, you're the guy who made the film. I've been trying to get a hold of you. have been talking about your trailer. So we sent the movie to the State Department. They asked for six more copies because there's a line to see the film. And they said, you know, usually for Eid, to celebrate Eid holiday after Ramadan, we have all these dignitaries come. We host, we host a dinner with, with Secretary Clinton. This year, in part because of your film, we're going to honor Muslim athletes who live in America from all over the world, the State Department. So we got invited to the State Department along with other Muslim athletes. Our guys got a picture with Secretary Clinton. She got up and talked about our film for four minutes. And basically, they hosted all these athletes in celebration of Ramadan. It was absolutely tremendous. The craziest thing was they gave you these going away chocolates when you left. And, and Hillary signed the bottom of like 500 of them by herself. It was amazing. Um, and it said Eid Mubarak. And you're sitting in your hotel room. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're really hungry. And you're like, do you eat the chocolate, or do you save it? So I wasn't sure what to do, so I put it on Facebook and asked a bunch of people questions, got like 40 responses. So what I did, I did what anyone would do in these days, is I took a, phone, a picture of it with my iPhone to keep it, and I ate the chocolate. <laughs> then AMC Theaters called. AMC Theaters saw our movie at the Kansas City Film Festival, loved it, and they had the guts to say, we're going to take your film, we're going to put it in 10 markets, and we're going to launch it on September 9th. This is after I met with a major retail chain who liked my film a lot, and they said to me, we love your film, here's the problem we have. The question is, how many customers are we going to lose by showing us a movie like yours in our theaters, because it's positive towards Muslims, versus how many are we going to gain? I had another company who wanted to put the film in 400 theaters for me on September 9th. We had negotiated a verbal deal. I went to meet with them. A minute before my meeting, they called me up and canceled the meeting. So AMC had the guts to take our film. We were the only independently produced documentary, meaning I distributed it, um, that they took all year long. And they put us in Times Square, they put us in LA, they put us in Dearborn, they put us in Chicago. We ran in 25 markets with AMC, and I'll tell you what, as a first-time filmmaker, to have your movie running next to Transformers and Contagion is, is unbelievable. <laughs> so the last thing that happened, and I'm, I'm out of time, but I'm assuming I get two more minutes, is that okay? Um, so the last thing that happened was, there was an article in the New York Times about a school called Iman Academy, which is a full-time Muslim school in the state of Texas. And in Texas, the private schools and the public schools are separated in terms of sports leagues. So there's an association called the Texas Association of Private and Parochial Schools. It's 218 high schools, mainly Christian, one, Jewish, one or two Jewish schools, that play sports for state championships and have academic competitions. I read an article about Iman Academy. Iman Academy applied for admission to TAPS and didn't get in. And the questions they were asked by TAPS, I won't get into, but I thought they were very bigoted um, and uneducated. And TAPS sent out a survey to all the schools in its membership. 35% responded. Of the 35% that responded, 65% said they were not in favor of having Iman Academy join TAPS to play sports against their schools. 10 of the schools said, if you let Iman Academy in, we will leave the organization. And I thought to myself, is this the country that we live in? where we can't have our Muslim kids play with Christian and Jewish kids and other kids in sports together? 
Is that really where we're at? And I go, and we're in Texas, and Amon is in Houston. Do you know the number one athlete in Houston that people have rooted for tw the last 15 years? Hakeem Elijah won. He goes to the mosque and he prays. You guys would be in lines out the door to get an autograph from this guy, yet you won't play against kids that practice the same religion as he did. In the past, we didn't have a tool to send to the schools that could adequately educate kids about Muslims in a, in a relevant way. So what my wife and I did was we were selling the DVD for $500 a piece to colleges, Harvard, Michigan, Iowa, University of Kansas, all about the film. So my wife sat down in our living room and she packaged 218 DVDs, over $100,000 worth of retail DVDs, and we shipped them to every school in TAPS with a letter. And the letter wasn't threatening, it just said, we want to share some stories about our religion with you in the story. So I sent my contact information, three schools called All Catholic, and they sent me emails and said, we don't stand for what TAP stands for. We've asked our Catholic Association to evaluate our membership. We believe in justice and fair play. The best email that I got was from a president of a school who said, I love getting your DVD. I received it in the morning, and I'm teaching a class on justice and, and racism and discrimination and equality, and I played your entire film for my kids somewhere in the middle of Texas. And he said, by the end of your movie, the kids in my class were not only cheering for your players, they were standing up and clapping and during the football game. And one of them said, how can we get this movie to share it with our friends? And the thought that I'm going to leave you with is this, is I don't know if I've rebranded Islam the way I set out to do. I didn't get the distribution that I may have wanted. But through the stories of the lady I met at the Sovereign Challenge, through the people we affected at TAPS, through the people we met in Traverse City, we slowly but surely have begun to turn the tide and present our story to people. And it takes a lot of time to get the message out there, but one by one we're impacting people. So the path you take may not be the road that you thought you were going to be on, but if you don't take that journey and deliver a message and get your product out there, whatever it may be, you'll never know what's going to happen to you. So Michael Moore wouldn't have happened, and Hillary Clinton wouldn't have happened, and all these other great stories. So take that journey, embark on that challenge, because great things are going to happen to you whether you can see them or not. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time.